excited that we have uh, three physician leaders with us. Um, as you all know, sometimes that in our history of healthcare, physician leadership has been an oxymoron. Uh, it is not that way anymore. Uh, and so first, uh, uh, Dr. Howard Grayman, the uh, CEO of Peace Health Medical Group. Uh, Dr. Richard Popeil, the CMO and EVP of Cambia Health Solutions. Uh, and uh, uh, Ra Dr. Ralph Pros, Prows, I'm sorry, trying to remember that. Pros, Prows, Ralph Prows, uh, the uh, CEO of Oregon's Health Co-op. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, and so let me just start, Howard, I know you've thought a lot about this, and, and, and we'll get to the news that Peace Health made around this um, soon, maybe now, but what do you see, how is the definition of value changing from where you sit, leading a medical group closely aligned with a, a multi-state hospital system? Well, from the physician group, I, I think there are two big buckets in which I would think of this. From the physician group, um, and first of all, I would always define value as the, the old-fashioned equation of um, quality patient experience divided by cost, and we look at it that way whenever we make any plans. But from the physician point of view, uh, I think what we need to do is focus on executing in the area of population management in a way that, frankly, most um, health systems and doctor groups haven't done, with the exception, perhaps, of Kaiser over the years. And that's all of the basic uh, functionality that's part of the medical home, is the, is the common term used, but whatever you call it, it's providing better access, um, taking care of hospitalizations and transitions more, more effectively, um, creating registries where the most complex patients are identified and case managed so that they minimize the uh, use of the expensive port portions of care and also get their health better so they stay out of the hospital, um, changing physician behavior uh, so that we begin to practice more responsibly, um, evidence-based way, so that we are prescribing generic medications, we're not overusing labs and x-rays. I'm one of those people that believes it's probably true that up to 30% of what we spend for healthcare really doesn't provide any benefit to our patients, sadly, over the years. We've gotten used to that, and we need to learn how to do it better. So I think, in general, redeveloping the behavioral patterns of physicians, which we all know is an easy task, is probably the biggest thing that a medical group is facing in the new world of pay-for-value. Now, as part of an integrated delivery system, uh, our medical group has a particular, uh, a, a different and additional responsibility, and that is we, we all know that if we all do our job well, uh, the need for, for inpatient beds is going to shrink, and our medical group, although it's 800 doctors in three states, only is 10% of our revenue for our entire organization. So we need to learn how to expand our network of care and the influence of our hospital so we can continue to have those high-cost parts of our system properly utilized by having a larger catchment of patients. So the medical group's job is also to grow, um, not necessarily by employing more doctors, but by aligning with physicians in our, the communities that we serve. So we have a, a greater footprint, if you will. And tell us just you know, briefly about the vision or what is going on, what was announced this week in, uh, in Southwest Washington by Peace Health and the Vancouver sure. Clinic joining. Well, this is a great example of um, thinking, rather than being wasteful and building a medical group to compete with an existing strong group, one of the communities where we have um, our presence, we've decided to become partners with a physician-owned multi-specialty group called the Vancouver Clinic, which is over 200 physicians. They're the largest organized medical group. They're larger than our Peace Health group is in that town, probably twice the size. And we've decided to come together and uh, develop an independent practice association and begin looking to work with payers uh, to take risk contracts and begin to together reduce the cost of care and maintain the quality of care. Uh, this is a fairly new experiment that we've just launched, and we're trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Looks good from where you sit today, right? We'll see how it looks five years right. down the road. Um, Richard, how about from where you sit, uh, you know, physician, leader at a major health plan, how is the definition of value shifting as you uh, view the scene? So just to uh, capture the point that you made a moment ago, uh, we spent $2.7 trillion dollars Probably when they do the calculation, it's going to be closer to 2.8 after the last year. $2.8 trillion on health care in this country. It's about 18% of uh, GDP. The closest industrialized country to us is, I think, the Netherlands. They're at about 11 to 12%. And your point was that about a third of that, or $900 billion, is related to health care waste, inefficiency, fraud and abuse, uh, and lack of coordination of care. And, and 
I want to make this point because I think the three of us, and I, I'm just getting to know both of these uh, individuals as well as others. I just moved here to the Northwest recently. I, I, I'm sure if we spent some time together, they, they have in their respective role, current and prior roles, have been working hard at trying to get at this issue of cost and, and also the inconsistent quality that's delivered to uh, people in this country. Uh, and people have been working on this for 25 years, so when you talk about value and you look at the outcome of what our healthcare delivery system has been able to produce today, uh, there's a big disconnect. So what, what's happening um, today, in part uh, because of that, in part because of healthcare reform, um, is, a, is a rapid transformation um, around this value equation. So what had been partners before are now competitors, so delivery systems are becoming delivery systems and health plans, health plans are becoming delivery systems, uh, and new entrants that are disrupting all of that, uh, like Walgreens and uh, Walmart, uh, are coming into the equation. So we're in a bit of a dust-up right now relative to uh, health care, but all of these are what I would consider experiments uh, directionally uh, on the right track, uh, and uh, it's kind of wait and see in terms of uh, the value that uh, they deliver. And so, like many other organizations, our organization uh, since January has launched about 31 accountable care, we call them accountable health, to embrace and encompass wellness and prevention uh, arrangements across the four uh, states that we do business in. Uh, and that is around, uh, again, to your point, population health, uh, changing the visibility uh, of a physician from the next patient who goes into the office to the entire population of uh, patients who they care for, whether they're in the office or in any other environment. So having that broader, comprehensive view and creating navigation and coordination across the continuum. Uh, so that's still um, uh, unproven in terms of how effective, how much value it delivers, uh, but there's certainly some very promising early results that are coming out uh, in many markets around the country. Yeah. So, Ralph, I would assume that as uh, you have developed Oregon's Health Co-op and as you've thought through the exchange, uh, or rather just entering the Oregon market generally, that this question of a different value proposition from other traditional health plans has probably been central in your planning and thinking. Shed a little light on how the co-op model of a, of a health plan is addressing this question of value. Well, um, under the Affordable Care Act, the creation of co-ops or consumer-operated and oriented plans was intended to be inserted into the healthcare markets specifically to be something of a disruptor, actually. In many of the markets across the country, there were only one or two or three large health plans maybe there anyway. There were no guarantees that those plans would even play on the exchange or play with the Affordable Care Act. So. Uh, there, there's that piece, bringing competition into the markets. And then, of course, the other uh, overriding issue there was the uh, bringing the consumer voice, the public option, if you will, into healthcare and creating some sort of an entity that could ex be the expression of what the consumer actually wants uh, in the markets. Uh, this was kind of a hybrid arrangement uh, that was agreed to, um, uh, a compromise, if you will, between the a political faction in the country that is pro uh, single payer public option and those that weren't. Uh, and the creation of co-ops was really the blend of the two. So uh, in my organization and each of the other 24 co-ops in the country, uh, we will have boards of directors uh, comprised in the majority from um, the members that that organization serves and provides health care benefits to. So. Uh, everything that the organization does must be centered on what those consumers actually want in the market, which I've learned over the last year is actually quite different than what I thought it was uh, in my prior role and roles um, in how Oregon. How so? How so? Well, how so? Um, I traveled around the state last year, uh, met with over 2,000 Oregonians, collected even more feedback uh, from survey work that we did. Uh, because, because I thought it was the appropriate role for a co-op to start out with. Go out, listen to people, see what it is that they do want. 
And we asked questions in these focus groups, um, you know, what's important to you? Um, how important is your health? How, how big a deal is your budget right now for you? And um, what's working or not working in terms of your insurance planning or insurance coverage? And um, I learned some strikingly different things than what I'd uh, learned to believe before. For example, I had uh, kind of grown, I think, a bit cynical from the health plan perspective, uh, thinking that people really aren't that engaged or activated around their own health, and they were quite content really to sit on the couch with a remote control and a bag of Cheetos, uh, you know, and watch TV. I could not have been more wrong. In every, every single focus group I sat in on, people told me about how they were struggling to stay healthy, move more, lose weight, quit smoking, et cetera, et cetera. It was a big deal, high priority. And I um, learned that uh, they wanted health care in a very different way. They wanted it in, in their most convenient possible terms. They wanted to be prudent purchasers. And they couldn't figure out how to do that because of the complexity of the whole payment model that, we're all, that we've all faced. And they were, by that, they would say things like, um, we never know what we're going to actually have to pay for something because we get co-payments, but then there's the co-insurance element that comes in and the 20% out of a pocket there, and that's kind of a gotcha. And then there's the deductibles, and that's another gotcha. And then if I go to the hospital for an outpatient surgery procedure and I get a bill from the anesthesiologist, even though I thought I went to the hospital, it was on my network, and I thought the surgeon was in my network. Turns out the anesthesiologist wasn't contracted, so I'm ending up paying the difference between what the health plan allowed and what the bill charges actually were. So it was, it was all this about these gotchas, and, and, and it comes down to this. People, people want to be prudent purchasers. They are cost conscious. They're living on slim budgets. The economy's tough, but they can't do it under the current scenarios that health plans provide to them. Mm -hmm. So my job as a co-op was to listen, and it is to listen, and that's what this organization must always do and always be very patient-centered in that. And what we translated this to were some very unique Oregonian kinds of things, like um, uh, bringing on naturopaths as primary care physicians, because we heard that in every single session, and that's weird, and it's uniquely Oregon. And when I go anywhere else, they look at me and shake their heads and think that that's just bizarre. Frankly, I would never talk about that uh, in a room full of actuaries unless I first uh, charged up the AED and handed out depends to everybody in the room because we'd have a mess on our hands in a minute because you can't predict these costs. And the convenience factor, you know, um, got down to we want to be able to call our doctor and email our doctor and save ourselves the time off work and save the dollars associated with an unnecessary office visit. And I don't know how many here have had to go to the doctor before just to get a prescription refill when there was really nothing really wrong with you. But uh, that sort of thing really yeah. could just be eliminated from the system. Yeah. Um, and then we got rid of coinsurance just because it's a, it's a nightmare for everybody to administer. From the physician side, it's a nightmare to go about that collection cycle. And from the consumer side, it was terrible. So it's the co-ops, I think, bring into this, this whole uh, discussion that very, very consumer-focused, consumer-controlled, consumer-oriented uh, kind of value statement. It's all about the consumer in my market and bringing them together with providers I think, to work out these uh, nitty-gritty details on how to make it better. Yeah. So, Richard, you know, I, I commented earlier today, and, and I find this true with, with me and our firm all the time. We just are so busy, we forget that it's about patients. Uh, and so, you know, in Ralph's comments, um, the consumer is central to the, their model. I know uh, it is central to how Cambian Regents approach uh, the market, but but flesh that out for us. Tell us a little more about how Cambia and, and Regents is thinking about the consumer, how they're putting the consumer uh, in, in the center, and, and maybe differentiate between Regents and and all of the thinking in, that goes into the exchange work, and then all of these other very very consumer centric uh, organizations underneath the Cambia umbrella as well. So there were a lot of questions in that. <laughs> One question, so let me see I if I can... I tend to ask five or so, and I'm going to take a about where you go with it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I mentioned earlier that I just came here. I, I've lived on the East Coast all my life, and I moved here in early January. Uh, and one of the main reasons I came uh, was for the opportunity at Cambia Health Solutions. Regents is a set of health plans that sit underneath the parent company, Cambia Health Solution, 
and that's what health solutions, and that's what we are, a health solutions company. So in addition to providing health plans, which is health insurance, which as I think everyone in this room knows, insurance, whether it's health, auto, uh, or life insurance, has uh, saved millions of Americans over the last hundred years from financial catastrophe uh, because it spread, spreads risk um, a, a across a population. Uh, but one of the things that really got me excited about uh, Regents in particular is they have really been a front runner in terms of really focusing on the consumer. That has been historically their sweet spot and they've built a whole set of capabilities uh, designed to engage um, and, and support uh, the consumer experience. Uh, so how so? I'm sorry? Speak to that. How so? What are some examples? Uh, MyRegents.com, which was created in the early 2000s, which was a consumer portal, um, a uh, wellness and prevention capability um, that encompassed things like health risk assessment and biometric testing, uh, as well as categorization of uh, individuals at risk and reaching out with navigators and coaches. Mm -hmm. Th those kinds of things were developed at Regents. Uh, years before they were developed at a lot of other health plans, including the health plan that I came from. Uh, they, uh, in the last couple of years, Regents has uh, expanded its focus um, uh, in part because it can be a health solutions and some of the assets that it, it has developed, the transparency tools in its co a subsidiary company called HealthSpark. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a company uh, called CoPatient that helps consumers navigate through the financial struggles that Ralph was just alluding to a moment ago. So there's lots of examples where uh, both Cambia Health Solutions and the region's family of health plans uh, have, have really delivered um, uh, on uh, the consumer experience. That said, we're moving into this new world uh, in the context of healthcare reform um, where the market is shifting from mo basically a group market uh, to a retail market. And so when you think about retail, you think about the individual and what that consumer experience is, whether it's how they acquire uh, health insurance and their experiences once they acquire it. Uh, addressing, in many ways, many of the things that Ralph just mentioned. Yeah. Um, really understanding the different segments of the population uh, and how to best uh, position the, the, the capabilities they need uh, to be healthy or to get healthy. And so those are the things that we're working on. Great. So I, I want to open this up for questions. Um, please don't be shy. You can come to the mic or you can just yell at the top of your lungs. Uh, Howard, while we wait for folks to come up, I'm, I think this question of uh, physician leadership or this issue of physician leadership is really very interesting. And uh, it's tied to value, I think. And I think, I think you think that. Uh, but I also think this in, in, embedded in physician leadership is this question of culture. And how do you develop and sustain and build a, a physician culture of engagement and, and leadership? How do you approach that question of developing a culture at Peace Health that really supports all of this stuff we're talking about? Supports collaboration, supports team models of care, all mm -hmm. that stuff. <clears throat> What do you think? It's a great question. I think uh, lots of large medical groups have suffered over the years by treating their doctors like employees and, and promote um, a sense of that mindset that, you know, I, I punch a clock, I come in, I work a number of hours. By, by taking away uh, control of the immediate environment of the practice, professional folks like doctors really lose interest in managing what they really should be managing best. And um, there's a fellow named Daniel Pink, some of you may have heard him speak, who has this great approach to, uh, there's three things that um, are consistent with professional satisfaction. They're autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And in the medical profession, we're pretty good at purpose because we take care of people who are sick. That's a great thing. Most doctors want to do a good job, and most do. But if we take away the autonomy, most physicians very quickly will lose interest in being entrepreneurial and doing what's right for the patient in their context. So one of the things we've done is we're trying to, within some envelope of reality, of productivity and quality and the things that you want to have in a high-performing medical group, allowing the physicians to control the environment of their practice as much as possible so they're comfortable with it and they set it up the way that they enjoy practicing and feel is best for their patients. Yeah. And changing that culture is what we're in the middle of doing right now. It's not easy because it's gone through years of being the other way. I think it's important. I, I want to mention, can I just go back Please. to something else about 
patient choice, and this is going to sound um, uh, perhaps controversial in the state of Oregon. But I believe that we have swung the wrong way in completely having open access to specialty care and EDs and wherever a person decides to go. Uh, we can't afford that kind of freedom of choice anymore. And I have to say that, um, unfortunately, the bad name that HMOs and gatekeepers got 15, 20 years ago has um, caused us to be very constricted in our willingness to insist on people choosing a PCP and to have that decision be made in a coordinated fashion of going to a specialist, for instance. We know in communities that have strong primary care, the health of the population is better. And we know that probably two-thirds of the time, when a person makes a decision to go directly over their PCP to a specialist, it's the wrong decision. The person they're seeing is not capable of handling the problem. The appropriate tests have not been done ahead of time. It becomes a more costly event. So I think we need to maybe rethink in this culture the idea that it is a good idea to not just promote, but in some ways, um, I hate to use the word require, mandate, that, that in order to keep costs under control, people have a primary care uh, advisor or provider to help them navigate the system. And I, I'm sure there's controversy about that, but I just want to put that out there. So uh, just to, to weigh in on that, I, I had the privilege of uh, going overseas uh, a couple of weeks ago with a group of 30 healthcare executives to study the Dutch healthcare system. Uh, and like the United States today, everyone in the Netherlands is required to uh, have health insurance. But in addition to that, everyone is required to choose a primary care physician. Mm -hmm. And that primary care physician is not a gatekeeper, they're an advocate. Uh, and the specialists <clears throat> are all linked to the hospitals. And, and they have a highly competitive um, and viable health insurance market who helps manage that component of the healthcare, sec uh, healthcare sector. Uh, it, it's a elegantly simple system and it produces uh, far better results than our system does. But I do think, to the point you made, one of the key elements of that system is the intimacy of the patient with a primary care physician who uh, acts as uh, a caregiver as well as a navigator for them. So, Ralph, you know, when, when I, I have heard people say, I heard it at our dinner last night, um, you know, how do you promote health system integration when that runs headlong into antitrust law, uh, FTC regulation, uh, consumer choice issues, and uh, when we know after multiple studies that price is determined, 75% of which uh, by uh, market leverage, um, not by cost, right? Um, how do you sort of how do you view these kinds of questions of integration of care delivery, the kinds of things that often very clearly produce better collaboration when you're the CEO of a health plan? And as a new one, very limited ability to bring downward pressure on, on highly concentrated uh, provider groups, be they a hospital or, or any other provider group. What do, you, what do you think about some of those questions? Uh, the whole antitrust issues is huge and it's daunting uh, and we have areas in Oregon that in, in essence are already uh, looking very much like monopolies. Uh, communities, counties where there's really only one hospital system and that hospital system already employs the majority of the physicians in that area. You know, and if, if something, uh, if, if they've got economic problems, they have no one to blame it themselves because there's no one else who can uh, actually manage the cost in that area but them. And in some of these areas, the cost of care in Oregon is the highest. Um, if you look at Portland, for example, we have, what, five major hospital systems. Uh, if, you, if you include Southwest Washington in there, you've got six. Um, and uh, we actually have pretty competitive pricing across these systems. There's, there, there's some competition going on there. But if you f move further south, uh, particularly if you go down into the Lynn uh, Benton uh, county area, you have one hospital system. It owns all the hospitals. It's very dominant down there. And it just also so happens that the, that is the highest per capita cost area, age-adjusted, risk-adjusted in the state of Oregon. Now, th th maybe that's an accident. Um, but for any particular, here's the problem, and, and Richard's got the same problem, of course, uh, because re uh, reg regents may have, you know, 25, 30 percent of the market, but still as an individual health plan, there is no 
individual carrier in the state that has enough leverage to do much about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that as a public policy matter, um, this is something that people need to pay attention to. And what gets even more complicated is this. If we start thinking about um, CCOs in the same context, some CCOs have filed for commercial insurance licenses. Now, CCOs were created to be Medicaid delivery systems and to deal with population-based health for uh, the, those Medicaid populations in their, in their regions. And that's a great idea. I mean, the whole idea of the population-based care, of integrating care with, a, with a, a, in essence, a capitation for managing that population puts all of the incentives in the right place in terms of the accountability for cost and quality in the delivery system. But you have to watch out for the cost shift and what might happen if they then, if those organizations then file for and receive a certificate of authority to the commercial business and also have a Medicaid, Medicare license. Now you've got Medicaid, commercial, and Medicare uh, under a single entity that is provider owned. Provider owned. By law, that's what CCOs are. So, whose interests get, get the attention here? What happens to cost? You have, you have all the ability in the world to cost shift to the commercial market. If you're not getting what you want out of, out of Medicaid, or getting what you want out of Medicare. So I worry about that. So do you see, do you think that you see some of this cost shift in the current commercial rates coming over from Medicaid as a result of downward pressure on CCO uh, payments? I think it's too early to say, but historically that has actually been the case. I mean, we all know that, that uh, for uncompensated care and, uh, and the underpayment from the government programs, the commercial market, Probably everybody here that has uh, commercial insurance has seen increases in part, and their estimates about how big those are, 30%, I've heard, uh, maybe more, yeah. are in fact representative of that cost shift. So, uh, Howard, you asked a question a year ago at dinner uh, with Don Berwick. I remember it well. Uh, and you said, and you were not sort of, you were just throwing this out. You weren't advocating this position. You, uh, I should make that clear, um, or you can clarify. Uh, but you said to Don Ber Berwick at the time, you know, how, how do we keep great doctors? How do we keep the kind of technology um, that patients demand? How do we keep uh, great institutions? How do we meet consumer demand unless we can have the resources to, to pay for that? Uh, how do we collaborate unless we have the organizational structure? I'm now paraphrasing because this is added on. How do we collaborate unless we have the organiz organizational structure uh, in which to collaborate? Um, that, that runs headlong into this kind of view a little bit as well. How do you, what do you make of this kind of conversation in light of the fact that you got to pay docs and you got you to have buildings, you got to have technology, and you got to do those things? And Don's answer, if I remember, was quite simple. He said, the escalating cost of health care is simply a failure of management. Yeah. And that we don't do a good job of holding down the costs in hospitals or in medical, other medical facilities. And we just keep asking for more. And uh, it's a very interesting response. And you know, I suspect the truth is somewhere in between. Yeah. Uh, I do believe, uh, on the physician side, that there is a physician compensation bubble that's coming. Uh, that we're, we're beginning to see that the, medic, the CMS or MGMA benchmarks that we use to decide how to pay our doctors are beginning to soften and, and level and are going to begin dropping. Yet in the marketplace, physicians still have the ability to go to the highest bidder. And so I think there, we, there's going to become a day of reckoning where the costs, at least on the doctor side, are going to begin to change. It's always hard to be the first one in the market to say, okay, I'm going to start reducing physician compensation because um, you don't do so well if you're the only one doing it. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think uh, just like reimbursements to hospitals uh, is, gonna, is, is happening already and will continue, I think physicians will have to reset their expectations uh, for income. And um, on the technology side, I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, this is America. We want the latest, the best, whether it's proven to be better or not. It's new flavor, so it's worth trying. And um, new drugs, new technology is always going to push costs up in a way that's inappropriate. And unless we get into some um, government-appointed uh, panel that says what's an okay procedure, what's not, which I think is part of ACA, hasn't been established yet, uh, unless that functions well, we're going to continue to see that spiral. Yeah. 
Richard, what do you make of all this conversation? It's complicated. <laughs> so it's projected that 1,000 hospitals are going to fail over the next five to 10 years in this country, about 20% of all hospitals in this country. And while I uh, agree uh, around the cost shift comments, uh, I think as, as we move forward, most of that's going to be historical because what's happening at the hospital level is the uh, shift of business mix or uh, payer mix going mostly to government payers. So the more government patients that a hospital cares for, the less ability to cost shift to a commercial member. And, and actually there's an even more dire situation that a hospital faces, which is that it's not just payer mix, it's the type of patient that they're going to be caring for, shifting from a higher margin surgical patient to a lower margin, lower margin chronically ill medical patient. And so there are a number of forces, and there's others as, uh, in addition to these two, that are going to create intense pressure at the hospital level. Uh, and the, the ability to survive isn't going to be uh, cost shifting, uh, or trying to drive more revenue um, in by capturing the marketplace um, by acquiring physicians. It's going to have to be a transformation uh, of the marketplace through collaborations that really get at the population um, health uh, and cost uh, and allow for uh, access and distribution of dollars in ways different than they are today. So, I, I mean, we're, we're at the cusp of a crisis uh, because of all of these pressures. And, and if uh, the healthcare system uh, aligns around its historical silos, the payers, uh, the physicians, the hospitals, the uh, pharmaceuticals, and uh, others, um, we're just going to get what we've had, uh, except we're going to be in a much more significant crisis. So, uh, I, you know, to me, I think you're going to see very unique collaborations. Uh, over the next five years. Um, and uh, you're going to see a right-sizing, candidly, I think, at the hospital level. Um, a as more um, empowerment occurs between a physician and a patient, and they have more uh, accountability and responsibility uh, to manage that, uh, they're going to take advantage of the opportunities uh, in front of them, including uh, the specialist referrals that you mentioned before. So. I was going to say that in most of the conversations I'm having with colleagues around the country or at meetings, the, the, the mantra is learn how to live on Medicare. Yeah. Most health systems recognize that because of the squeeze you're talking about, you know, the uninsured are going to be able to be folded in through the exchanges, but commercial rates are likely to drift downward, and so it'll end up being the Medicare rate. And most organizations are 10 or 20 percent above Medicare in their cost structure now. Yeah. So this is a huge change. You're seeing Peace Health announced a, a, a downsizing recently. Cleveland Clinic just said they're going to they're 330 million dollars off on their budget for this year. So even you know reputable, high-performing organizations are beginning to do some tough things. Yeah, Ralph, what do you? Uh, I mean, I think we all. Let me ask a different question. Do you think that the Affordable Care Act? Do you think exchanges are catalyzing this pressure? Are they? making the pressure worse? Do they create solutions that alleviate the pressure and move us towards change, or are they not relevant? That's a great question. Um, the impact of the exchanges on all of this, I think, in the short term are about competition on, on insurance rates and about innovation uh, by, among the insurance companies, I think, uh, that maybe hasn't been um, hasn't had enough incentive in the past because it's been a pretty opaque system. Uh, and it's, it's been largely unaffordable. And for those that had any kind of pre-existing conditions, uh, you know, they were out uh, either on OMIP or they went bare uh, in many cases. So we, have, we now have a really competitive, competitive situation among all the health plans. And if you just look at what happened in this first round in Oregon, I mean, there were, there were uh, in the tri-county area here, there were, uh, you know, maybe 10 health plans that are now on the exchange, a couple pulled out. Um, and among those 10, about seven of them repriced themselves uh, to come down. And a lot, and, and you can say what you want, but I think a lot of that had to do with seeing what others' rates were coming in at and deciding that they just were too high. 
So I think just this first round, while some of this was kind of engineered, because I think the Division of Insurance had its hands full trying to figure out how to prevent the chaos, they, uh, you know, we did manage to see a lot of rates come down, as much as 40% in at least one case. So that pressure is there among the health plans. Secondly, you've seen uh, innovation really take hold, because now health plans have an incentive to really distinguish themselves on features other than the essential 10 benefits uh, that are built in to that. So they're coming up with all kinds of interesting models around primary care-based uh, networks and uh, HMO look-alike networks, limited networks, uh, the things that we're doing. Um, so all that, I think, is very healthy mm -hmm. in the market. Now, I think the question then, to Howard's point, is if there is less margin coming in to these health plans um, through this very competitive market, does that mean there's going to, in some way or other, be more downward pressure on, on, uh, comp on reimbursement rates uh, with delivery systems? You know, it probably does. Uh, to some degree. Um, but again, the fact that there are 10 health plans in this market um, and 14 or 15 statewide means that no individual plan really has a strong arm twisting leverage on a delivery system to push that hard. Uh, so I think it remains to be seen. I, I think getting back to Howard's earlier point, um, I think that uh, we really does have to get back to everybody understanding that in this quote healthcare system we have today, if it's a system, there are three really important um, components to it. The first, and each of those three components I think needs to very clearly understand what their accountabilities are to the public and to the population they serve. It's interesting because I think you got all three sort of represented here by design or accident, DJ. So uh, you've, got, you've got the delivery system, which I'll just say that's Howard right now. And it's a, it's a really good delivery system. They're doing great stuff. And they're fully focused and willing to take accountability for what they do. Cost and quality, patient experience, um, they're, they're there. And they're, they're looking to figure out how to do that really well. And that's great. They're going to knock the waste out of the system, figure out how to integrate and lower cost. And by the way, they'll be accountable through the measurements that are built into this accountable care organization structure or CCO structure. Great, that's what they're accountable for, delivering high quality care with a good patient experience at an affordable cost. Health plans, and I'll, I'll take Richard as the example of a big health plan here. Health plans are accountable for helping to organize the, you know, their disparate delivery systems around the state and build the necessary infrastructure in terms of informatics and reporting and measurement uh, and a compensation system that's not fee-for-service, but is an alternative system to allow them to do that really well and measure it and report on it. And then you've got the consumer. And um, this is the part of the conversation I think has gotten very little attention. It got no attention, attention in the creation of ACOs because the federal government didn't want to mess with the Medicare program and the incentives that could or could not be created within that program for the consumer to actually take some accountability here. We all hear and talk about that. You know, what is my role as a patient? What's my role as a consumer in this? Well, I mean, stay healthy. Stop doing bad stuff that's making you sick. You know, you got to get upstream of disease and start thinking about health and wellness. That's my job. Now, Richard here can help me out a lot with that by building some of the programs they've built. And that's good, but basically it's going to come down to me. But who's telling me? Who's really saying that in a way? Who's really getting down there into the weeds of my community and working on the social determinants of health as well as the individual accountability and activation? That's kind of new ground, and I think we've, I think we've got to get very explicit about that and a little bit more dramatic in terms of our benefit designs mm -hmm. to enable the consumer to see, understand, and become activated around their own health and, of course, around how they spend their uh, precious uh, family budgets. No questions. No one's coming forward with hands raised. I know you're, there are a few of you ready to. You're just not sure if you want to get out of your chairs. We only have a few minutes left. Um, and with those few minutes, Howard, I'll start with you. You know, you've, you've gone to medical school. You're on the administrative side now of healthcare. You've probably done some other things in your career uh, outside of healthcare. Um, and you're at this place now where, where your experience informs your innovation in this very dynamic period of time. And people that I respect who uh, have been in this game a little bit, you know, for a while, will say, uh, DJ, my biggest regret is that I 
didn't dream big enough and that I achieved all my goals. So what would you say to the people in this audience? What advice from your experience, and I'll ask all three of you as our closing question here, uh, what advice would you give today's attendees based on your experience to do with this amazingly dynamic opportunity, this maybe once in a generation opportunity that we have in this time period right now? Even though I practiced general internal medicine for 35 years and believe very strongly in the doctor-patient relationship and importance of touching patients and seeing them when they're ill, I think the visit to the doctor is terribly overemphasized in this, or in this society. And I think the biggest game changer we could do would be to learn how to take care of people outside of the context of the health system. Um, is to have people visit people in their homes, have monitoring devices that they can feed in electronically to the doctor's office, to have somebody on the staff look at it. There's no reason why we have to see somebody with diabetes and hypertension three or four times a year. If they're well controlled, they could be monitored by, a, by a, a handheld device now, and we could um, communicate with them through a portal, through the, our electronic health record. I think we can do a much better job taking care of a larger number of patients if we get people used to the idea that um, the, the actual meeting with a, a professional a provider uh, should be um, circumscribed around something that's really important, like a poorly di a, a yet to be defined illness or a chronic condition that's not responding to routine care. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with the uh, shortage of primary care doctors and the swelling of both the elder generation and the people coming into the roles through ACA, we're going to have a really great, uh, a difficult time managing care unless we change the paradigm of how, what care means. Yeah. Richard, uh, your advice in about a minute based on the experience and uh, of your career? It's tough to ask me to answer in just a minute because I'll answer by telling a quick story and this should help inform. So my good friend Jeff Brenner, uh, who uh, kind of coined the concept hop, hot spotters in New Jersey, formed this concept of ambulatory intensive care unit, uh, challenged me when I was back in New Jersey that uh, to take the most complicated patient we had, uh, who we thought we were managing well in our uh, collaboration with the delivery system, and he could actually find opportunities. So we risk uh, adjusted and rank ordered um, our highest risk patients and found a patient on uh, renal dialysis who had been admitted to the hospital 69 times in the prior year. So we looked at our, was he in case management? Yes. The, he get all the things that needed to occur, a health risk assessment, a visit by the nurse, a review of medications, going to the doctor, et cetera, all of that was done. Uh, and so Jeff and one of his staff went out to the dialysis center, and there he was at the a scheduled appointment, and he had been coming on a regular basis uh, to his dialysis appointments. And they had a very nice conversation with him. He had been taking his meds, doing all the things that he was instructed to do. And then they met with the uh, the, the staff and they say, this is the nicest guy. But you know what, halfway through his dialysis session, he says, I can't stand sitting here anymore and he has to be disconnected and leaves and then obviously has complications. So they went back and talked to him for a moment and they realized that as in the conversation that he liked to draw and paint. So they came back to the next dialysis session and uh, brought materials for him to draw and paint. And now if you go to Jeff Brenner's lecture, he'll show a slide with the painting of one of our members um, uh, after a, a couple of month period where he drew um, a beautiful picture, stayed in every dialysis session uh, and uh, never got admitted in that time frame. So uh, my advice is think differently. I mean, we, it, we thought we were doing everything right. Uh, the physician who was caring for this patient thought that we were doing everything right, didn't have this information, but there was a psychosocial issue um, that we would have never picked up that got picked up uh, through this mechanism, and so you just got to think differently. Yeah. Ralph, uh, we're out of time, but what advice would you give our attendees based on your experience in this dynamic period of time? Don't lose your passion, and don't stop caring about uh, the person sitting next to you, your neighbor, the people around you, your coworkers. Uh, you wouldn't be here today if you weren't passionate about health and health care and making things better for people. And we're in kind of a tur turbulent time right now, no doubt about it, but it's an incredibly exciting time. I mean, when, when have you ever seen something like this happen before? Uh, and yes, it's easy to kind of get lost and become a cynical naysayer because of 
all the kind of doom and gloom side of it, but you got to think about the positive side too. There's, you know, for every every bad part, there's a lot more that's going on here that's really terrific too. Uh, just the positive elements that have come with the Affordable Care Act. Look, the insurance industry couldn't have done this on its own. It tried and wanted to, in many cases, you know, but it couldn't help itself. Now we've got some real insurance reform. I think that's taking us a long way down the road. The um, elements in there that uh, actually addressed, address some of the um, innovative things that need to happen, address quality, address reimbursement change, and address uh, patient experience, they're all in there. It's going to take some time to um, adjust and to make these things actually happen. But we've got a great place to start from. So don't lose your passion. Don't lose your hope. Stay on this thing. Stay engaged. Make it happen, and we'll get there. Let's give them a round of applause.